Hello and welcome to Evangel Online. This is your channel where you can discover what's happening at Evangel right now and how you can be a part of it. Evangel is one church in multiple locations, including right here online. Feel free to explore our videos to see what God is doing in and through our church. You'll find stories of people just like you whose lives have been changed. People who are growing together, serving others, and making a difference in the world. You'll also find all sorts of resources to help you grow in your faith journey. From sermons and additional content from Pastor Jordan, to music from Evangel Worship, fun videos for kids, and content for teenagers to help them grow into confident adults, Evangel is a place that no matter where you're at, we want you to encounter Jesus. God has something so special for you, and we want to come alongside you and help you discover what that is. So subscribe here, check out all the content that's available to you through the links below. Thank you for watching and subscribing, and as always, welcome home. Genesis chapter 30. Today we are diving back into the series called It's Complicated with Family Dynamics. We'll jump into all things Christmas next week, but um, we had, we could have gone a lot more weeks with this, but um, we needed to get one more message in, and so I'm grateful to see everyone here as we dive into this last week of Family Dynamics. Genesis chapter 30. Verse 1, a peculiar passage, when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she envied her sister. I mean, no family jealousy is not a good thing, amen? She said to Jacob, give me children or I shall die. Jacob, his anger was kindled against Rachel, and he said, am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? Then she said, here is my servant, Bilhah. Go into her so that she may give birth on my behalf, that even I may have children through her. Pause. Jacob's grandfather, Abraham, Sarah, had a similar situation with a servant named Hagar, that didn't work out too well, y'all. How many know that there's some things called generational insanity? Like grandpa did it, dad did it, and now it's being served up on a silver platter. And she says, go into her that you may have children. And verse four, she gives him to her as wife and Jacob goes in and Bilhah conceives and bears a son for Jacob. Then Rachel said, God has judged me and has heard my voice and given me a son. Therefore, she called his name Dan. Rachel's servant, Bill, conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Then Rachel said, with mighty wrestlings, I have wrestled with my sister and have prevailed. Talking about family dynamics and tension, it's complicated here. So she called his name Naphtali, and when Leah saw that she had ceased bearing children, she's like, you know what? She had a good idea. So I'm going to do the same thing. And she took her servant, Zilpah, and gave her to Jacob as wife. Then Leah's servant, Zilpah, bore Jacob a son. And Leah said, good fortune has come. So she called his name Gat. Leah's servant, Zilpah, bore Jacob a second son. And Leah said, happy am I. For women have called me happy, so she called his name Asher. Father, we thank you for your word today. Speak to us, Lord, and help us to learn from your word. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. This will be our last week. You may be seated on Family Dynamics. Um, week one, I preached on Adam and Eve and how God had just given them how many responsibilities? Two. Two responsibilities. Work in the garden, steward creation, and be fruitful and multiply. And uh, we dug into how they messed up those two commands, right? Um, and how that, because of their mess up, they had to take ownership. Um, God corrects them, and then he covers and clothes them. And it's a lot of wisdom for us that walk through these family dynamics, amen? Week number two, Pastor Kim preached on the different roles of the family, Christ, husbands, wives, 
children and the placing of each one. And she also went back to Adam and Eve and how God used that to establish the roles within the family. And then last week wasn't part of our family dynamic series, um, or so we thought, but then pastor and evangelist Daniel Kalinda comes in and he preaches all about the family, right? And he as well goes back to Adam and Eve. He who has ears, let him hear. Like we didn't plan this out all to be around Adam and Eve, but when God is working and wiring all of this together, we better pay attention. And as, as Kalinda preached on this, he talked about the enemy who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And there is an enemy that is seeking to destroy your family unit. Amen? There is an enemy that is out for your total and utter destruction. And as the people of God, we must guard the garden. We must guard the garden. Today, we're going to be diving into week number three of this series, week number four, uh, talking about blended families, blended from a point of marriage. And um, I don't know if I'll have time. Um, I had written up some notes on blended from a point of belief systems as well. Uh, we'll see if we can jump into that depending on time today. I wish we had more time in this series because there are so many areas that we could dig into. And even if you are not married, you're single, and you're here today, um, you're still a part of a family. You got a mom, you got a dad. If you don't have that, you got a church family that you're with today, right? And it's important how we carry out our relationships with others, whether you're married or not, it's important how we carry out all of our relationships. And here's the reality. Let me tell you what I can't give you. The family dynamics. I cannot give you a playbook on what play to run and when to run it for every situation in life. I can't. I cannot give you a playbook on what play to run, when to run it, because every situation is unique. And every situation carries its own variables. But I feel like Peter and John, silver and gold, I do not have, right, as they're on the way to the temple. But what do they say? But in the name of the Lord Jesus, rise up and walk. Here's what I do have for you today is the name of Jesus, and he can cause every situation, regardless of how bad, how difficult, how tough it may look, he can cause every situation to rise and to come back to life if we will just lean in and trust trust his leadership in our lives. If we will just be Jesus, he can change everything around us. And some may say, well, pastor, that's not practical advice. Wrong, right? It's very practical advice because it means to be a vessel of his grace. Being Jesus means being a vessel of his mercy. And if we can learn to love like Jesus, to live like Jesus, to lead like Jesus, to give like Jesus, to serve like Jesus, if we can just be Jesus, it does not matter what the family dynamic may look like. God can turn them off all around because there is hope and I still believe it to my core that there is hope in the name of Jesus. The problem is our flesh doesn't like being like Jesus. That's the problem. Spiritually, if we can be Jesus, it's all gonna work out. You do God's ways, you're gonna get God's results. But there's a hindrance called the flesh. And the flesh likes to do what the flesh likes to do, right? And if we are going to succeed in blended families and any family unit, we cannot yield to our flesh. We must yield to our faith. I'm gonna say that again. If we are going to succeed in any family unit, blended or not, we cannot yield to our flesh. We must yield to our faith. And I realize, let me lay a foundation real quick before we dive in. People come to faith at all different points in life. People come to Christ at all different points in life. And I'm keenly aware that in this room today, 
there are all kinds of family dynamics. Step parents, step brothers, step sisters, half brothers, half sisters, foster children, single moms here today, single dads here today, orphans, win- widows, people who are here who have never been married, people who are here who may be on their third marriage. I'm keenly aware of all the different dynamics that are in front of us. And if we will just commit to being Jesus, regardless of where we're at, if we will commit to being Jesus today, everything will be okay, right? That's the hope. Everything will be okay if we will cling to him. If we're honest, we all have family dynamics. And sometimes, amen, they are not the best dynamics. They're complicated dynamics and maybe even crazy family dynamics. Because if you look back far enough, there is crazy in every single family. It's okay to be honest in church, right? There's crazy in every single family. And you might have even brought crazy to church with you today, right? There is crazy in every single family. My mom said, well, you're going to sure air out all the dirty laundry in our family. I sure am today. Because guess what? There's crazy in my family unit. Which is why Jesus is our standard. Other families are not our standard. Because in Jesus, there's no crazy. Right? People look from the outside and say, oh, it looks really good over there. But listen, over there, there's crazy. If we will keep our eyes on Jesus, the author, the perfecter of our faith, that's where we are to set our eyes, not on what somebody else has and what it looks like they have. They're not the standard. So give you a little bit of our crazy, all right? My mom's aunt, um, she's gone on to um, heaven now. Um, She was one that was raised in a very godly home. And by the time she passed away, she had five different husbands, five different husbands. And the man she was living with, when she, I'm just kidding. She wasn't the woman at the well, y'all, right? (laughs) She wasn't that person. Um, But five different husbands, that's, that's a lot. Like that's, that's crazy. Um, it gets worse. I have a great, great grandmother. And she murdered her husband. Yeah. Like she murdered her husband. Like that's in the family lineage. It's there. I have other in the family lineage. You can go look it up on news that they were most wanted. They were outlaws. Right? There are people in the family background, the family lineage, that it's, it's absolutely crazy. Crazy. On my wife's side, my mother-in-law. She's not crazy. She's from a family line that's crazy. I love you, Lola. I know you're watching. But I learned after we had been married that she's from a headhunting tribe in the Philippines. A head-hunting tribe. Like, that doesn't bring much peace within the family. And so I started asking questions. I was like, how far back? She's like, oh, it's, it's far, far back in the family history. I'm like, your dad? She's like, oh, no, 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 far back, far back. I'm like, your granddad? She's like, yeah. I'm like, that's not that far back, guys. <laughs> like, there's crazy in every family unit. And I finally understood, like, why we couldn't stay in the village when we went to the Philippines to go visit. I'll be on the market being sold, y'all. Like, keep me out of there. Like, there's crazy in every dynamic if you look back far enough. We all have them, but here is the testimony in this. And I say this to to let you know, we're all there and we all have it and we've all dealt with it. Here's the testimony in this, that generational craziness, it can and it will stop through the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? 
Thank God there were people in my lineage that said, this stops here, this stops now. We are not gonna perpetuate the cycles of insanity. We're not gonna perpetuate the cycles of brokenness. We are going to break the generational curses and we are gonna receive the gift of God into our lives and our family dynamics into the future. They will and they shall be changed in Jesus' name. There is hope in the name of Jesus, regardless of whatever the past may look like. And today, my goal is wherever you find yourself and whatever family dynamic you may find yourself in is to help us create Christ-centered relationships that will thrive. There is hope. There is hope. We are able because he is more than able. You know how I know this? Because the Bible is full of jacked up families that it didn't start well. It didn't start well, but it ended with the redemptive thread of grace flowing in and through their families and God doing the impossible. So as I was preparing for today's message, I started in a very different point than I normally do. I started at a point and I started thinking and said, Lord, who had one of the most jacked up families in the Bible? What family unit in the Bible would make it on Dr. Phil or Jerry Springer today? And we landed here. Point number one, if you're taking notes, point number one, crazy. One man and four baby mamas. One man and four baby mamas. Jacob, Leah, Rachel, Bilhah, and Zilpah. Chapter 30, verse 1, when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she envied her sister. She said, Jacob, give me children or I shall die. This is the story of Abraham's grandson, Jacob. These aren't just any people. These are the patriarchs. Everybody say patriarchs. These are the Hall of Famers, the MVPs of our faith. These are the patriarchs of our faith. This is Abraham's grandson, who their family dynamics at a minimum were crazy complicated. A little backstory. Jacob has four baby mamas. He was married to two sisters, first mistake. And then he proceeded to have children with both of the sisters, But not only did he have children with both of the sisters, they say, hey, it's a good idea. Have babies with our servants as well. Talk about family dynamics. One man, four women, 13 children, all in one house. You can't fix stupid. Amen? (laughs) Jacob didn't just have a family tree. Homeboy had a forest that was growing under his nose. Like, it's crazy. It's crazy. And the reality is they weren't sure if they were half brother or cousin. They weren't sure what their relationship was and it is complicated. They don't get along well. There's rivalry between the wives who are sisters. There's rivalry between the servants. There's rivalry between the kids. And on top of this, Jacob decides it's a good idea to play favorites. Like you have all this craziness under a roof and he says, you know what? I'll play some favorites as well. I'm talking about family dynamics here today and how God used this family. And I don't think any of us have that kind of craziness under our roof. Right? I don't think any of us have that kind of chaos under our roof. And yet God still used this situation. Many of you know the story. Ten of the brothers, they get mad at one of the brothers, Joseph, and they eventually, they, they get angry and they sell him into slavery. They try to murder him. They want to sell him and they sell him into Egypt. And where Joseph at this point, he goes through a very rough spot in life. And then in a major, major turn, God a turn of events, Joseph becomes second in charge of Egypt. He goes from pit to, to being sold, going to Potiphar's house, going to prison, and then in a major turn of events, he now finds himself a second in charge of Egypt. And God does the unthinkable. He serves up all of his family to him on a silver platter. Watch this. And Joseph had a decision to make. Do I perpetuate the cycles of craziness and brokenness and cut them all off? 
and do what my flesh wants me to do? Or do I lean into my faith and allow the grace and the mercy and the redemption that he has displayed to me to flow through me and flow to them? Will I allow God's redemptive power to flow through me and change a generation? Church, this hits home because many of us are in that place. Do I perpetuate the cycles of insanity? And I'm probably just in doing that because of what's been done to me. Or do I allow my life to be a picture of God's grace? I want you to imagine yourself in Joseph's shoes. How do you handle your half-brothers? How do you handle your stepsisters? How do you handle the step-parents? How do you handle those who have willfully tried to shame you, kill you, do all manner of evil against you? Let's look at Joseph and how he handled this crazy. Point number two, if you're taking notes, forgiving the fractures and failures of family. And this is where it gets quiet. Genesis chapter 50. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will perpetuate the insanity. He will hate us and pay us back for all the evil we did to him. And I don't want to discount this. Evil was done. I'm not naive to think that in the family brokenness, that evil hasn't been done, that wrongs haven't been committed, that there are things that have been very hard, difficult, and hurtful in life. And God doesn't disregard that evil had been done. Amen? I'm talking the real gospel today, right? Evil had been done. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave us this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgressions of your brothers and their sin because they did evil. They did wrong. They did wrong to you. Now, please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, being in the place of able to say, hey, you can live or you can go and die. He says, do not fear for I, am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many People should be kept alive as they are today. Maybe the reason the choice is in your hand is because God could trust you with the ability to forgive when the sibling or the step-parent or the half-brother, he could not trust with the ability to be able to offer the grace and the mercy that is necessary to see their life changed and transformed. Yes, you may have meant it for evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many Many people may be kept alive as they are because they receive the grace, the mercy, and the forgiveness from God that flowed through Joseph. Salvation was wrought to a family unit that needed salvation. Church, you may be in that place today because God trusts you to be able to offer the grace that we have received. Freely we have received, freely we must give. So do not fear, verse 21 says, I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Point number two, forgiving fractures and failures of family. Joseph's family unit, we just read and went through, was severely fractured and had completely failed, right? The chapters between Joseph's betrayal and the family's restoration are filled with brokenness and hurt and pain and tragedy, yet despite all of this, God miraculously weaves his thread of grace throughout one of the most difficult families in biblical history, right? And he brings beauty to the brokenness. I want you to say that, beauty to the brokenness. Say it again, beauty to the brokenness. I don't care what brokenness may exist, God can bring beauty to the brokenness. I want you to picture it in your mind right now, beauty to the brokenness. I don't care how dark it may look, I don't care how bleak the outcome may look, God can bring 
beauty to the brokenness if we will allow his redemptive thread of grace to flow through us like Joseph allowed. Verse 17 shows how Joseph, he weeps for his brothers. He tells them, don't fear. You meant it for evil, but God has meant this for good. God brought it about for good. Church, Joseph forgave a great bit, right? He forgave jealousy, rage, betrayal, a murderous spirit. I'm not sure if most of us would be capable of doing that. But the reality is Joseph did not wait to forgive when the opportunity presented itself. That's one of the secrets of forgiveness. Make a decision ahead of time that you are going to choose to forgive, amen? I believe that Joseph had long beforehand forgiven the wrongs that had been driven against him in his life because at some point, things were made right between him and God Almighty. That's the only way that Joseph could be a conduit of his grace. And if things are made right between us and the Lord, we cannot help but forgive. Freely we have received, freely we must give. Whether you're in a blended family or not, we must choose ahead of time. Mom, dad, stepmom, stepdad, stepdaughter, son, choose ahead of time to forgive. How? Just as God has forgiven the inexcusable in us, we must forgive the inexcusable in others. Just as God has forgiven the inexcusable in us, we must forgive the inexcusable in others. Why? Because redemption is God's plan. Jesus on the triumphal entry wept when he saw Jerusalem, the city that was getting ready to betray him, the city that was getting ready to murder him, the city that was getting ready to wrongly try him and give him a wrong outcome. And what does he do? How is he moved? What is his response? He begins to weep because he sees the impending disaster and the destruction that is coming upon Jerusalem. What does this mean? God's heart does not desire the destruction of mankind. His heart is moved towards us. His heart desires repentance. His heart desires reconciliation and the full and inclusion of all of his children. This is what the Bible is about, a narrative of God restoring relationship with mankind and then mankind restoring relationship one with another. And like Joseph allowed forgiveness to flow through his life, we must be a conduit to allow forgiveness to throw, flow through our complicated family dynamics. Our forgiveness to others could quite literally mean their salvation. I want you to think of this. The power of forgiveness, you forgiving someone could quite literally save them from their destruction. Joseph's family, if they weren't forgiven, they died in famine, right? They died in plague. They died hungry and without food. But because he was willing to forgive, he became an oasis in their desert. He became a supply in their famine. He became their salvation in the midst of their destruction. And God wants you to be an oasis in the desert. He wants you to be a supply in a famine. He wants you to be salvation in the midst of destruction. Because if we will forgive others as God in Christ has forgiven us, it will paint a much clearer picture of who our God is to a world that is around us. Forgiveness does not justify a wrong. It does not endorse a wrong. It does not mean the wrong committed was okay. Forgiveness simply releases the wrong of its power over your life. And that wrong carries a lot of power. That wrong carries a lot of great power. Jesus said, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly father, will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you your trespasses. Ephesians 4 says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted toward one another, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Worship team, if you'd go ahead and come to the stage. Joseph's ultimate purpose 
ultimate purpose of Joseph's life was to see the salvation of God's people. And it could not happen without an incredible story of forgiveness. What if the ultimate goal and purpose of our lives is to see the forgiveness, the salvation, the full inclusion of those that are right around us? One of the greatest tests in our lives is whether we will be willing to forgive. It's not easy, right? doesn't always come without pain or tears, but it is the right thing to do. It is the right thing to do. It's the godly thing to do. As God in Christ forgave you. As humans, we don't tend to get stuck on the good things in life. We tend to get hung up on the bad things, the difficult things the wrongs that have been committed against us and we play the victim card and the victim mentality and we go down that path. But God has not called us to be a victim. He's told us that we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus who loved us so. Church, I cannot give you a play-by-play on how to handle every situation. Every situation is unique. But in blended families where trust, watch this, might be lacking and faith might be frail, because of the failures and the fractures of the past, forgiveness must roar. Forgiveness must roar louder than the ocean, right? God's grace must roar louder than the mightiest ocean. Two, two quick tips for blended families can apply to any family. Number one, be Jesus. Be a vessel of his love. Be a vessel of his grace. Be a vessel of his mercy, his forgiveness. I want you to imagine, if you close your eyes with me, I want you to imagine Niagara Falls. Gallons of water that rushes over the edge of that fall. One of the most iconic falls in the world. Millions of gallons rush over. And it drenches and it washes. That's what God's grace, love, and mercy on display should look like in our family. Washing over and drenching and covering and cleansing all of the wrongs that have ever been committed against us. His love, his forgiveness is greater than Niagara Falls greater than the mightiest ocean. And we should allow that love, that grace, that mercy that we've been given, regardless, I know that's a big word. That's a big word. Regardless of the wrongs that have been committed, we should allow that love to wash and flow over our homes and family like the waters rush and flow over Niagara Falls. It's the only way that blended families where there's complications, fracture, faults, failures in the past, it's the only way things can be cleansed, things can be purified, things can be restored, is if we allow his grace and his mercy to wash over us. Number one, be Jesus. Number two, be consistent. Be consistent. You can look at me. Our society has gotten to a place where it hates absolutes. Everything's non-binary, right? We don't want a foundation. We don't want a sure foundation. We don't want an absolute foundation. Our families have to have a constant foundation absolute truth, right? The word of God, that's what I'm referring to. We must have the word of God. We must be Jesus and we must have truth. Jesus didn't come in just grace, but he came in grace and 
grace and truth. We gotta have the washing of grace. We gotta have the word of God as our foundation. We have to have truth. Why? Because truth's not convenient. Truth's convicting, <laughs> not convenient. Truth convicts. And truth, it doesn't convict just them. It convicts us all, right? And when we have a constant standard that we are all held to, it gives a consistent measure of conviction that we all need, right? Which is why I said other families aren't our standard. Jesus is our standard, right? And if we will just be Jesus, we'll operate in grace and mercy, kill the flesh, Operate in grace, mercy, love, kindness, kind, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as Christ and God forgave us. And if we will be consistent, it sets our families up for the best outcome, right? It's putting good inputs in. And the more we put good inputs in, there's gonna be a good outcome. That's what we gotta do. We gotta put the good inputs in so that we can have the good outcome. Everybody's heads bowed and eyes closed this morning. I didn't have time to get into blended belief systems today. I'll give you one tip. Stay focused on the soul. Don't focus on behavior. Focus on the soul. Don't let politics be primary. Let the soul be primary. Don't let lifestyle be primary. Let the soul be primary. And then be Jesus and be consistent. Same two things. But I want you to look in right now. Look into your heart. How are you doing at forgiving those like Joseph? Forgave his brothers. He didn't just forgive them. But he said, do not fear. I will provide. He moved from a place of forgiveness to provision. I will provide for you and I will provide for your families. How do we bring healing? How do we bring health to complicated family units? We forgive. And then we say, we're not just going to forgive, we're going to provide. Right? We're going to let it to rush over us, to wash over us. How are you doing this morning? Maybe you're seated by your spouse right now or a sibling. I want you to just grab their hand. I want you to just begin praying right now. You just begin praying over your family unit. There's an enemy that comes to still kill and destroy. And we must be so quick, so quick to forgive. He wants our destruction, y'all. He wants our destruction. But God came to give you life. He came to give you hope. And he came to give you a future. And will we yield to our flesh? Or will we yield to our faith? Just begin praying over your home and your family right now. Begin releasing the wrongs of the past. The failures of the past. The fractures of the past. I want you to just begin to say grace. Begin to speak grace and mercy over them. Let it flow like Niagara Falls over your life right now. Whatever that situation is, just begin to speak grace. Begin to speak grace upon grace upon grace upon grace over the situation. Let it just begin to rush. Let it begin to flow. Come on, the Holy Spirit's wanting to mend your heart this morning. The Holy Spirit's wanting to bring healing to your heart. I want you to just begin to release it. Release it at his feet. Release it to him. Begin to just let it rush over. Whatever the person, situation, whether it's a step, whether it's an ex, whether it's a half-brother, half-sister, whether it's wrong that's been committed, I want you to just begin to release it right now and let grace, let mercy, let it wash over them. Their soul is so much more important right now. Let the Holy Spirit heal you right now. Let the Holy Spirit bring healing. 
He wants to mend your heart. He wants to mend your wounds. And we cannot hold on to those things that have the healing that he's provided. We must release and let go. Father, we release it to you this morning. God, we give you our hearts. We give you our lives. We surrender ourselves to you. We surrender ourselves. Altar team, if you would come on down to the front, all of our ministers and pastors, if you would stand with me this morning, if you need prayer over your family situation, your family dynamic, I want you to get out of your seats and I want you to begin rushing to these altars right now. If there's things that you've been battling, situations that you've been walking through and that are challenging, and you say, Pastor, I need prayer this morning, I want you to just begin to rush forward right now. God is here. He wants to mend your heart. He wants to bring peace to your life. He wants to bring beauty to the ashes. I want you to just get out of your seat and come. Come. There's forgiveness that is waiting. There's grace. There's mercy that is waiting. There's no situation. There's no circumstance that is too far gone. I want you to just begin to release it to him this morning. Come on down to the front. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus.